Hi guys, uh, hope you enjoyed our last book. Uh, so I'm here with another one of my favorites growing up called How to Eat Fried Worms. Worms. Um, so we're gonna get started with the first couple chapters. Chapter one, The Bet. Hey Tom, where were you last night? Yeah, you missed it. Alan and Billy came up to the front walk. Tom was sitting on his porch steps, bouncing a tennis ball. Old man Tater caught Joe as we were climbing through the fence. So we all had to go back and he made us pile the peaches on his kitchen table. And then he called our mothers. Joe's mother hasn't let him out yet. Where were you? Tom stopped bouncing his tennis ball. He was a tall, skinny boy who looked, took his troubles very seriously. My mother kept me in. What for? I wouldn't eat my dinner. Alan sat down on the step below Tom and began to chew his thumbnail. What was it? Salmon casserole. Billy flopped down on the grass, chunky, snub-nosed, freckled. Salmon casserole's not so bad. Would she let you just eat two bites? Asked Alan. Sometimes my mother says, well, all right, if I'll just eat two bites. I wouldn't even eat one. That's stupid, said Billy. One bite can't hurt you. I'd eat one bite of anything before I'd let them send me up to my room right after supper. Tom shrugged. How about mud? Alan asked Billy. You wouldn't eat a bit. You wouldn't eat a bite of mud. Alan argued a lot, small, knobby kneed, nervous, gnawing at his thumbnail, his face smudged, his red hair mused, shirt tail hanging out, shoelaces untied. Sure I would, Billy said. Mud? What's mud? Just dirt with a little water in it. My father says everyone eats a pound of dirt every year anyway. How about poison? That's different, Bully, Billy rolled over on his back. Is your mother going to make you eat the leftovers today at lunch? He asked Tom. She never has before. How about worms? Alan asked Billy. Tom's sister's cat squirmed out from under the porch and rubbed against Billy's knees. Sure, said Billy. Why not? Worms are just dirt. Yeah, but they bleed. So you'd have to cook them. Cows bleed. I bet a hundred dollars you wouldn't really eat a worm. You talk big now, but you wouldn't if you were sitting at the dinner table with a worm on your plate. I bet I would. I'd eat 15 worms if somebody bet me $100. You really want to bet? I'll bet you $50 you can't eat 50 worms. I really will. Where are you going to get $50? In my savings account. I've got $130.79 in my savings account. I know because last week I put the $5 my grandmother gave me for my birthday. Your mother wouldn't let you take it out. She would if I lost the bet. She'd have to. I'd tell her I was going to sell my stamp collection otherwise, and I bought that with all my own money that I earned mowing lawns, so I can do whatever I want with it. I'll bet you $50 you can't eat 15 worms. Come on, you're chicken. You know you can't do it. I wouldn't do it, said Tom. If salmon casserole makes me sick, think about 15 worms would do. Joe came scuffing up the walk and flopped down. Beside Billy, he was a small boy with a dark hair and a long nose and big brown eyes. What's going on? Come on, said Alan to Billy. Tom can be your second and Joe will be mine. Just like in a duel. You think it's so easy? Here's your chance to make 50 bucks. Billy dangled a leaf in front of the cat, but the cat just rubbed away, rubbed against his knee, purring. What kind of worms? Regular worms. Not those big green ones that get on the tomatoes? I won't eat those. I won't eat them at all at once. It might make me sick one worm a day for 15 days. And if he can eat them any way he wants, said Tom, boiled, stewed, fried, fricasseed. Yeah, but we provide the worm, said Joe. And there have to be witnesses pr present when he eats them, either me or Alan or somebody we can trust, not just you and Billy. Okay, Alan said to Billy. Billy scratched the cat's ears. Fifty dollars. That was a lot of money. How bad could a worm taste? He'd eaten fried livers, salmon loaf, mushroom tongue, pig's feet. Other kids' parents were always nagging them to eat. Eat. His had begun to worry about how much he ate. Not that he was fat, he just hadn't worked off all his winter blubber yet. He slid his hands into his shirt and 
furtively squeezed the side of his stomach. Worms were just dirt. Dirt wasn't fast fattening. If he won $50, he could buy the mini bike George Cunningham's brothers had promised to sell him in September before he went away to college. Heck, he could gag out anything down for $50, couldn't he? He looked up. I can use ketchup or mustard or anything like that. As much as I want? Alan nodded. Okay. Billy stood up. Okay. Alright, that was chapter one. So I got two questions for you. First question. What started the bet? Tom wouldn't eat his dinner the night before. I don't know. Salmon casserole doesn't sound like right, right up my alley either. What was the bet? Billy would eat 15 worms for $50. Ugh. Not so sure about that one. So we'll see how this plays out in the next coming chapter. But eating worms does not sound like something most of you would do. All right, chapter two, it's called Digging. No, said Tom, that's not fair. He and Alan and Joe were wandering around behind the barns at Billy's house arguing over where to dig the first worm. What do you mean it's not fair, said Joe. Nobody said anything about where the worms we're supposed to come from, we can get them anywhere we want. Not from a manure pile, said Tom. That's not fair. Even if we didn't make a rule about something, you still have to be fair. What difference does it make where the worms come from, said Alan? A worm's a worm. There's nothing wrong with manure and joke, said Joe. It comes from cows just like milk. Joe is sly, devious, and a schemer. The manure power pile had been his idea. You and Billy have got to be fair too, said Alan to Tom. Besides, we'll dig in the old part of the pile where it doesn't smell much anymore. Come on, said Tom, starting off across the field, dragging his shovel. If it was fair, you wouldn't be so anxious about it. Would you eat a worm from a manure pile? Joe and Alan ran to catch up. I wouldn't eat a worm, period, said Joe. So you can go by that. Yeah, but if your mother told you to go out and pick some daisies for the supper table, would you pick the daisies off a manure pile? My mother wouldn't ask me. She'd ask my sister. You know what I mean. Alan and Tom and Joe learned, leaned on their shovels under a tree in the apple orchard, watching the worms they had dug squirming out of, on a flat rock. Not him, said Tom, pointing to a nightcrawler. Why not? Look at him. He choked a dog. Geez, exploded Alan. You expect us to pick one Billy can just gulp down like an ant or a nit? Gulping, not eating, said Joe. The worm's got to be big enough so Joey has to so Billy has to cut it into bites and eat it with a fork. Off oh, a plate. Is this one or nothing, said Alan, picking up the nightcrawler. Tom considered the matter. It would be more fun watching Billy trying to eat the nightcrawler, he grinned. Boy, it was huge. A regular python. Wait till Billy saw it. We'll let you choose where to dig, said Alan. After all, thought Tom, Billy couldn't expect to win $50 just by gulping down a few measly little baby worms. All right, come on. He turned and started back towards the barns, dragging his shovel. Not really sure about that whole manure thing. That just sounds pretty, well, disgusting. Let's go on to chapter three, training camp. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Billy was doing push-ups in the deserted horse barn. He wasn't worried about eating his first worm, but people were always daring him to do things, and he found it was better to look ahead to try and figure out to get himself ready. Last winter, Alan had dared him to sleep out all night in the igloo. They'd build in Tom's backyard. Why not? Billy had thought to himself, what could happen? About midnight, he huddled shivering under his blankets in the darkness. He'd begun to wonder if he should give up and go home. His feet felt like aching stones in his boots. Even his tongue inside his mouth was cold. But half an hour later, as he was stubbornly dancing about outside in the moonlight to warm himself, 
Tom's dog, Martha, had come along with six or other dogs all in a pack. Billy had coaxed them into the igloo and blocked the door with an orange crate. And after the dogs had stopped wrestling and nipping and barking and sniffing around, they all gone to sleep in a heap with Billy in the middle of in the middle as warm as an onion in a stew. But he hadn't been able to think of anything special to do to prepare himself for eating a worm, so he was just limbering up in general, push-up, knee bends, jumping jacks, red-faced, perspiring. Nearby, on an orange crate, he'd set out bottles of ketchup and Worcestershire sauce, jars of pickle lilies and mustard, a box of crackers, salt and pepper shakers, a lemon, a slice of cheese, his mother's tin cinnamon and sugar shaker, a box of Kleenex, a jar of maraschino cherries, some horseradish, and a plastic honey bear. Tom's head appeared around the door. Ready? Billy scrambled up, brushing back his hair. Yeah. Ta-ra! Tom flung open the door. Alan marched in, carrying a covered silver platter in both hands. Joe slouching along the side and with a napkin over one arm, nodding and smiling. Obsequiously. Oh. Obsequiously. That was hard. Tom dragged another orange crate over beside the first. Alan set the silver platter on it. A chair, cried Alan. A chair for Monsieur. Come on, said Billy. Cut the clowning. Tom found an old milking stool in one of the horse stalls. Joe dusted it off with his napkin, showing his teeth, and then ushered Billy onto it. Ladies and gentlemen, shouted Alan, I present my masterpiece, Verm a la mode. He sweeped the cover off the platter. Arg! cried Billy, reconciling. All right, so I have some questions for chapter two and three right here. So, in chapter two, why didn't Tom think it was fair for Alan and Joe to get the first worm out of the manure pile? It wasn't fair to ask Billy to eat a worm with manure on it, because that's gross. It's also unsafe. So, yeah, I don't think that would be a fair at all. What type of worm did Alan and Joe choose as the first worm Billy should eat? They chose a very large night crawler. So, kind of like the ones right here behind me. Which seems pretty gross if you ask me. Alright, we'll continue our story after this. All right, welcome back. Um, reading how to eat fried worms. Our main group of boys were discussing what they would eat, Whitney, and the one kid got in trouble because he wouldn't eat salmon casserole. And there was a bet that happened. It was bet that Billy wouldn't eat 15 worms, and if he does, he wins $50. If he doesn't, he has to pay $50. So they made the bet, and his friends went and found the first worm out of a manure pile. If you know what that is, it's gross. If you don't, you can ask somebody. They can tell you how disgusting it is. And the first worm they bought was a night crawler. When we stopped reading in the last chapter, we had just revealed the worm to Billy, and all he could say was, "R." Alright, so chapter four. The first worm. The huge night crawler sprawled limply in the center of the platter, brown and steaming. Boiled, said Tom. We boiled it. Billy stormed about the barn, kicking barrels and posts, arguing, A night crawler isn't a worm. If it's a worm, it'd be called a worm. A night crawler's a night crawler. Finally, Joe, Joe ran off to get his father's dictionary. Night crawler. Earthworm. Especially. A large earthworm found on the soil surface at night. Billy kicked the barrel. It still wasn't fair. He didn't care what any dictionary said. Everybody knew the difference between a night car crawler and a worm. Look at this thing. Ugh. It was as big as a souvenir pencil from the Empire State Building. Ugh. He poked, with, poked it with his finger. Alan said 
they'd agreed right at the start that he and Joe would choose the worm. If Billy was going to cheat, the bet was off. He got up and started for the door. He guessed he had other things to do besides argue all day with a fink. So Tom took Billy aside into a horse stall and put his arm around Billy's shoulders and talked to him, talked to him about George Cunningham's brother Mini Mike and how they could ride it on the trail under the power lines behind Odell's farm, up and down the hills and bounding over rocks. Rum, rum. Sure, it was a big worm, but it'd only be a couple more bites. Did he want to lose a mini bike over two bites? Slop enough mustard and ketchup and horseradish on it, and he wouldn't even taste it. Yeah, said Billy, I could probably eat this one, but I got to eat 15. Can't quit now, said Tom. Look at them. He nodded at Alan and Joe, waiting beside the orange crates. They'll tell everybody you were chicken. It'd be all over school. Come on. He led Billy back to the orange crates, sat down, and tied the napkin around his neck. Alan flourished a, the knife and fork. Would Monsieur like eat carved lengthwise or curse them? Ketchup? asked Joe, showing his teeth. Cut it out, said Tom. Here. He got ketchup and mustard and horseradish on the right night crawler, squeezed a few drops of lemon juice, and salted and peppered it. Billy closed his eyes, opened his mouth. We whooped in. Tom sliced off the end of the night crawler and forked it up to him. But just as he was about to poke it into Billy's mouth, Billy closed his mouth and opened his eyes. No, let me do it. Tom handed him the fork. Billy gazed at the dripping ketchup and mustard, thinking, Ah, it was all right talking about eating worms, but doing it? Tom whispered in his ear, Mini bike. Glug. Billy poked the fork into his mouth, chewed furiously, gulped, gulped. His eyes crossed, swam, squinched shut. His flapped, he flapped his arms wildly, and then opening his eyes, he grinned, beat, beatfully up at Tom. Superb, Gaston. Tom cut another piece, ketchuped, mustard, salted, peppered, horseradish, and lemon. It and handed the fork to Billy. Billy slugged it down, smacking his lips. And so they proceeded, now sprinkling on cinnamon and sugar or a bit of cheese, some cracker crumbs, or Worcestershire sauce, until there was nothing on the plate but a few stray dabs of ketchup and mustard. Bell, said Billy, standing up and wiping his mouth with his napkin. So, we are done with me the first curse. Nah, seconds? Let me look in your mouth, said Alan. Certainly, certainly. Yeah, said Joe, see if he swallowed it. Look as long as you want. Okay, okay, said Tom. Leave him alone now. Come on, one down, 14 to go. How'd it taste, asked Alan. Goot, goot, said Billy. Ver fine, ver fine. Hoo hoo. He flapped his arms like a big bird and began to hop around the barn crying. Goot, goot, very fine, very fine, goot, goot. Alan and Joe and Tom looked worried. Uh, yeah, goot, goot. How you feeling, Billy? Tom asked. Yeah, stop flapping around and come tell us how you're feeling, said Joe. There he is, flapping around the barn. Maybe the manure was not a good idea. They huddled together by the orange crates as Billy hopped around and around them, flapping his arms. Goot, goot, very fine, very fine, hoo hoo. Alan whispered, it's crackers. Joe edged towards the door. Don't let him see we're afraid. Crazy people are like dogs. If they see you're afraid, they'll attack. It couldn't be, whispered Tom, standing his ground. One worm. Goot, goot, screeched Billy, hopping higher and higher and drooling from his mouth. Come on, whispered Joe to Tom. Hey, Billy, burst out Tom suddenly in a hearty, quavering voice. Get it out, will you? I want to ask you something. Billy's arms flapped slower. He tiptoed menacingly around Tom, his head cocked to one side, his cheeks puffed out. Tom, Tom hugged himself, chuckling nervously. <laughs> uh, cut it out, will you, Billy? Uh, <laughs> Billy pounced. Joe and Alan fled, the barn door banging behind them. Billy rolled on the floor, helpless with laughter. Tom clambered up, brushing himself off. Did you see their faces? Billy said, laughing, climbing over each other out the door. Oh, jeez. Joe was pale as an onion. 
Yeah, said Tom. <laughs> you fooled them. Oh, jeez, Billy sat up. Then he crawled over to the door, peered out through the knot hole. Look at them peeking up over the stone wall. Watch this. The door swung slowly open. Screeching, Billy hopped out to the door sill, into the yard, up onto a stump, splashed into a puddle, flapping his arms, rolling his head. Alan and Joe galloped up the hill through the high grass, yelling, Here he comes! Get out of the way! Then Billy stopped hopping and climbing up on the stump, called in a shrill, girlish voice, Oh, boys! Where are you going? I'd something tear you, little boys. Alan and Joe stopped and looked back. I'm all doing home, little boys, yelled Billy. Did you tear? Who scared you, Lunk, called Alan. Yeah, yelled Joe. I guess I can go home without being called scared if I want to. But ain't who did I do? Golf ball hurry, shouted Billy. I just remembered I was supposed to help my mother wash windows this afternoon, said Alan. That's all. He turned and started up through the meadows and his hands in his pockets. Yeah, said Joe. Me too. He trudged after Alan. Okay, well, that was a fun chapter. I've got some questions for that chapter. Um, chapter, uh, sorry, question one. What's Billy's motivation for eating the 15 worms? He wants to eat, sorry, he wants to buy a mini bike with the money. Why did Billy pretend to be crazy after eating the first worm? Tease and scare his friends, and scare them he did. Would you bet eating worms, 15 worms, if you could get $50 out of it? Don't know if I could eat 15. I, maybe you could. Um, well, I have eaten one, but that's a whole different story. All right, so we will continue our story. He has one worm down. 14 more to go. Can't wait to figure out how he does it. Alright, welcome back. Oh, so, Billy has to eat 15 worms. 50 bucks. With that 50 bucks, he wants to buy a mini bike. And mini bikes were pretty cool back in the day. Um, he acted kind of crazy after his first worms to get back at his friends for the bet. And. The first worm came from manure, which if you, as I said before, ask someone what that is if you don't know, but it's gross. So now we're going to read chapters 5 through 9, and then we'll have some questions after. Okay? Chapter 5, The Gathering Storm. Alan and Joe stopped in the orchard by the pile of fresh dirt. You think you'll be able to do it? asked Alan, biting his thumbnail. I don't know, said Joe. He can't do it, said Alan. How could anybody eat 15 worms? My father will kill me. Fifty dollars? He ate that one awful easy. Forget it, said Joe. If he doesn't give up himself, I'll figure something out. We could spike the next worm with pepper. He'd eat one piece and then another, talking to Tom. Then all of a sudden he'd sneeze, ka and then he'd sneeze again, ka and then again, ka choom ka -choom. A faint look of panic would creep over his face. He's beginning to wonder if he'll ever stop. He clutches his stomach. His eyes begin to water. ka -choom, ka -choom. Billy's awful stubborn, said Alan. Even if it was killing him, he might not give up. ka -choom, ka -choom, cried Joe. He falls to the floor. I bend over him. God, I say, call his mother. It's the trogolococcus. His eyes bleed up at, at me. ka -choom. Remember that business last summer, said Alan, gnawing on his fingernail? When it was 95 degrees in the shade, and I dared him to put all of his winter clothes on and his father's raccoon coat and his ski boots and walk up and down Main Street all afternoon. Kachoom, kachoom! They went off through the orchard, Joe sneezing, sighing, rolling his eyes, pretending to be Billy suffering from a dose of peppered worm. Alan moaning to himself about how stubborn Billy could be. Fifty dollars. Chapter 6. The Second Worm. Billy sighed. On the plate before him lay the last bite of worm under a daub of ketchup and mustard. What's the matter? asked Tom. 
I don't know, sighed Billy. He picked up the fork again. Does it taste bad? No, said Billy wearily. I just taste ketchup and mustard mostly, but it makes me feel sort of sick, even before I eat it. Just thinking about it. He sighed again and then glanced at Joe and Alan, talking to others in whispers over by the window. What are you whispering about? Nothing. Then what are you whispering for? Nothing. It's not important. Just something Joe's father told him last night. What? Come on, finish up. It was nothing. We'll miss the cartoons. Billy shut his eyes and popped the last piece of worm into his mouth, chewed, gagged, clapped his hands over his mouth, gulped, gulped, toppled backwards on the orange crate, sprawling on his back in the chafe, he gazed peacefully up at the ceiling. Joe and Alan stood over him. Open up. Billy opened his mouth. mouth. Wider. See any, Joe? Nah, he swallowed it. Okay, let's go. Chapter 7. Red Crash Helmets and White Jumpsuits. After the movies, Tom walked home with Billy. Tomorrow, I'll roll the crawler in cornmeal and fry it up like a trout. It's not really the taste, said Billy. It's more the thought. When I start to eat it, even though it's smothered in ketchup and mustard and grated cheese, I can't stop thinking, worm. Worm, 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 worm. Gaggles of worms in bait boxes, drowned worms drying up on the sidewalk. A worm squirming on a fishing hook gores into him. The soggy end of a worm draggling along the dead fish's mouth. Robin's yanking worms out of the lawn. I can't stop thinking worms. Yeah, but if I fry it in cornmeal, it won't look like a crawler, said Tom. I'll put parsley around it and some slices of lemon, and then you can concentrate, think, fish. All the time you're waiting in the barn, all the time you're eating it, keep saying to yourself, fish, 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 fish. Here I am eating fish. Good fish. Trout, salmon, flounder, perch. I'll ride my mini bike into church. Dace, tuna, haddock, trout. Wait, wait till you'll hear the minister shout. Fish, 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 fish. Shark, haddock, sucker, eel. I'll race my father in his automobile. Eel, flander, bluegill, shark. We'll race all day until after dark. Billy cheered up. Think how they'll all stare. I'd read... Rev up the aisles, zip around the front pews, down a side aisle, under the stained glass windows. My parents would kill me. Reverend Yardard peer down over the Bible stand. William, he'd cry, William, you take that engine thing out of here this minute. Yeah, and then they'd come chasing out after us, said Tom. Billy laughed, wavering, waving their arms and yelling, and we'd lead them zigzag around and round and in and out and among the gravestones and monuments in the cemetery and then roar off down the sand gate. Road, leaving them draped over tombs and paintings and shaking their fist. Hup, hup, yelled Tom, dancing around the box, boxing the air. And that Monday, we'd smuggle it into class, disguised as Raymond Dilly, because he's so fat, and hide it in the coat closet. And then, when Millie Butler said anything, anything at all, even something like, excuse me, or if she sniffed, we'd dump a whole bottle of ink over her head, run for the coat closet, overturning chairs and desks behind us to slow up Miss Howard, She'd come after us, fuming and shouting threats, and suddenly the doors of the coat closet would slam open, and out we'd roar on our mini bike in blood red crash helmets and white jumpsuits, our scarves streaming out behind us, and we'd roar around and round the classroom while Miss Howard knelt among the overturned decks and chairs, sobbing helplessly into her hands, and then rum rum out the door and up the hall, thumbing our noses at the monitors. Brackety, 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 up the stairs, stiff-arming tacklers into Mr. Simmons' office, up onto his desk, broom, broom, a backfire in his face, and zoom out the window, he topples backwards in his chair in a hurricane of quiz papers and report cards. And then, crunch, landing on the driveway, we roar off down the highway to Bennington and join the Navy so Miss Howard and Mr. Simmons and our parents can't punish us. All right, so chapter eight, third worm. So Tom ran out of the kitchen of Billy's house, holding the sizzling frying pan out in front of him with both hands, the screen door banging behind him. Alan threw open the barn door when he saw him coming. Tom thumbed the frying pan down on the orange crate. There, he said breathlessly. 
done to a T. Look at her, all golden brown and sizzling. It looks good enough to eat. Yes, yeah, said Billy, and he poked a worm with his fork. Tom took off the potholder glove as he was, we he was wearing. Think fish, he said. Remember, think fish. Trout, salmon, flounder, perch. I'll ride my mini bike into church. Eel, salmon, bluegill, trout. Wait till we hear the minister shout. Clam, flounder, tuna, sucker. Look out here. Look out here we come, old Miss Tucker. Lobster, black bass, obster, oyster, sue. There goes New Orleans. Here comes Peru. He leaned over Billy and whispered into his ear. Fish, 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 fish. Go on and take a bite. Fish, 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 fish. Okay, second bite. Fish, 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 fish. So there is Tom with his cool uh, frying pan of worm. Chapter 9. The Plotters. Geez, you think it will work? said Alan to Joe. Suppose it doesn't. He didn't seem to pay much attention today. Don't worry, said Joe. You got him thinking. It takes time. I got it all doped out. Trust me. All right. So, first question. Why doesn't Billy like eating the worms? Why doesn't he want to eat this behind me? He doesn't like the thought of them. I mean... They look pretty slimy to me, and gross, and squirmy, and then again, I've already eaten one in my life. Um, is Tom being a good friend to Billy? What do you think? I mean, I don't know what you think. In some ways, no, because he's kind of peer pressuring him eating worms, but he's also making sure he doesn't lose that $50. He's doing whatever he can to help him not lose. So, I mean, that's a decent friend, right? All right, so our next chapters will be 10 through 12. So we'll see what happens.